Okay, we'll get started. I think it's time. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Maria Comas. I work at uh, Maze Labs. I'm based in Zurich, Switzerland. And I wanted to talk about GraphQL today, about the basics. Uh, GraphQL has been a hot topic lately, like more and more people are interested in it. We can see in these results from last year's uh, State of JavaScript survey that most people wanted to learn about it. And then the, from the people that had already used it, almost everyone would use it again. Uh, let's start with some background history. Uh, GraphQL was developed by Facebook by in 2012. Then three years after that, they decided that they wanted to open source it in 2015. And then just last year, uh, a foundation was created to provide a neutral and open home to help uh, further <laughs> develop and um, for more people to uh, use it. GraphQL, in essence, it's a long document that is uh, accessible online. This would be the first page. And what it does is it specifies a query language and execu uh, execution engine. So it's essentially a way for the client to say, hey, this is the data that I need. And then a uh, way for the server the, to say, uh, this is the data that I can provide you with. GraphQL then sits in the middle of the back end and the front end, or the back ends and front ends, and it provides this middle layer and this consistent interface. You can have uh, many back ends, and they can be different uh, kind of sources. It can be a file, or it can be a database, it can be a third party external API that you need to uh, access data from. And GraphQL abstracts that complexion and that comp uh, yeah and it makes it easy for the client to access the data and in the front end you can have also several uh, front ends it can be a mobile application it can be a web application and as long as they can send a graphql query to the server they'll get the data that they need garrett uh, gave a talk on graphql in last year's summit and his talk was about how he had been a skeptic uh, so far, and then when he started using it, he became an enthusiast. And what he liked be the best was not the technical aspect of it, but how it transformed the ways that the front end and back end teams uh, worked. He works in Netflix, and he said that he saw a dramatic improvement on how people were communicating about the data needs. So it, it's very nice to see that uh, it starts this meaningful conversation between the front ends and back ends, and also between the people that work in the different areas of an application. And in my head, I, I, it's kind of a pattern lab where you have these uh, libraries that define a set of UI components so people can talk about them and use the same words, uh, have a shared language and a shared knowledge of all the needs that uh, the application has and how to evolve that with time. So it's kind of something similar, but, but with uh, data. If we go back to why Facebook decided to uh, implement something new in the first place, what they saw is that because more and more people were accessing uh, Facebook through their mobile phones, uh, they had to be very efficient in the way they managed data. But it also had to be very easy to use because, of course, there's many, many people that would work on it and people that didn't have a lot of time to get familiar with the new thing that was uh, complex to use. So how did they manage to have something that was powerful and flexible enough to cater all of their needs, but at the same time uh, easy to use on the people side? They kept a few principles in mind. Uh, in the specifications, they defined them. And when designing it, uh, they thought that that would help them accomplish that complexity free and powerful tool. One aspect of it, I like to call it Wiggy's <laughs> And that would be what you get is what you ask for. And it's about, uh, from the client side, getting exactly the data that you need, no more, no less, but also being able to specify and describe that those data needs in a very natural way. If we look at that through uh, uh, an example, let's say we are tasked with implementing the UI for the profile page in GitHub. Um, 
it's, yeah, there's a lot of data that we want to display and it's organized in a specific way. Let's see, we could maybe start with uh, this uh, part here. It has a, like, the avatar, it has the name, the nickname, it has uh, optionally the uh, company where the person works and where they are located and also the website maybe. If you wanted to have that data so you can display it as a human, it would be an easy way to describe, to say, yes, I want to display information for this user that has this specific login, and I'm going to need a URL to show an image, I'm going to need a name, a login, a company, a location, website URL, etc. So this is what uh, GraphQL provides you with, uh, a language to say exactly that. To, this would be a, a query language, a query, where you can say, this is what I need. Please give, <laughs> give it back to me. And it would. This is what the response would be. And this is, by the way, like real production data. Uh, GitHub has an open public uh, GraphQL API that everyone can play with. And you can even, if you authenticate, you can even start repos from there or follow people. So these are screenshots from using the, the explorer that they provide. And we can see that the data that we, can, that we get back is exactly what we needed and in the shape that we specified it with. So it's very easy to work with that because you know exactly what you'll get and in which shape. If we wanted to maybe move on and say, okay, we also wanted to display who that person follows on GitHub. We can see here that the first person that she's following is George. So how would we extend that query to add that? We would add this following field, and then in this case, we specified that we want only to get the first result to simplify a little bit. And then for that result, we also want to get some information which is very similar to what we were um, asking for for the main uh, user. So the name, login, etc. The response. Yeah, again, it's, it's following the same shape that the query had. It has exactly the information that we asked for. And yeah, company, it's not specified, so it's just an empty string. And everything is as we expected it to be. Another important aspect is that it is strongly typed. So the server can guarantee and, and, can, and the client can guess exactly what, well, it doesn't need to guess, can know exactly which uh, data is uh, accessible. What that means also is that the tooling that can be built around this um, is very powerful. This is graphical and this is open source as well, so you can add that to your project very easily. This is the one that GitHub uh, provides. And we can see that uh, on the left, that's the query that we had. In the middle, we have the response that we saw as well. And then in the right, we have a documentation for the schema that they provide. So even if you're not familiar with their API or even if you're not familiar with GraphQL at all, you are able to go to this in-browser tool and start typing. This, uh, on the left, this model with a list of fields that you can add, you get that just by typing command space and that way you can start exploring what data is available. And as it can know exactly which queries will be valid as you write them, you will get very useful errors if you are asking for um, information that's not there or if you are missing a required argument or anything that might, not, uh, might make your query not be valid. You can even query the schema itself, so you would be able to get a list of all the fields that are available. Uh, in here, we don't see that, but we do see that we get the type name for the information that we are uh, requesting. So in both cases, uh, it's the user and then the um, user that Leah is following as well. In the right, uh, yeah, there's also a lot of information that you can get uh, by, uh, for exploring the schema. You can get uh, which type each field is going to return, some description sometimes, and what arguments that uh, field might accept, etc. 
we've seen uh, what the query can look like, and this is another example which is very similar. It's taken from this link that I have down there. It's a very, very good article about the basics of a GraphQL server. So this would be the front end part, the client side, right? Uh, we would have this user field uh, with an ID uh, to say which specific one, and then, yeah, from that one, I wanna know the ID and the name, even though we do know the ID in this case already. Uh, how would that look like on the server side of things? When you define a GraphQL server, there's two main aspects of it. Uh, there's the structure, and then there's the behavior. The structure is the schema, and the schema would be a collection of all the types, all the data types that uh, your application will have. Um, for this uh, example, we have the type query. That would be the one that all uh, GraphQL servers will have because it's the entry point for reading any data, and then in, in that we can see that we have a user field which accepts an ID, and it's, requ it's required because it has an exclamation mark, that's how you mark it, and it's gonna return a user. What is a user? User is another type that we define that has two possible fields. It's the ID, which is required again, and then the name, which uh, will be a string. But that doesn't tell us how to actually get the data. For that, uh, you have the function resolvers. So each field is mapped to a function resolver, and that is what makes it so flexible, because in that function, you can have arbitrary code. You can have anything in there. As we said in the beginning, uh, GraphQL is a specification. It doesn't tell you in which programming language you have to write your server or how to implement it. But um, this uh, here, it uses a reference implementation by Facebook written in JavaScript that other libraries uh, use as a reference. We can see that the, for the user field that we had before, in this case, we would resolve it by uh, calling a function, which is fetch user by ID, and we can see that we get the arguments and we get some other information that we can use to get the data that we need. With this, uh, we could see also what the user, how the user is gonna be, the fields that it has, how are they gonna be resolved. And in this case, because you always get the information from the parent field, uh, the user object in this case, uh, they can already return it because it's already accessible in the information that they get from the parent. Can we use this interval? Yes, uh, there's this GraphQL module, that's the main module, but then there are also other uh, related modules. So if you were to install this and enable the core module, you would get out of the box a schema which uh, gives you access to all of your content entities, other stuff as well, like image styles and menus, and you could also extend that and modify it as needed. There's two versions that uh, the one that I'm describing would be the three, uh, the third version. And then there's, there's this uh, fourth uh, version. And what that's about is because we were saying that having that flexibility and that conversation going on between the front end and the back end teams where they have to define what uh, data they need and how to structure that and you wouldn't get that with the version three because uh, it's out of the box. That means that it's very tight to how um, Drupal thinks about uh, content and how it models it. So it uses uh, Drupal specific uh, concepts like entities and bundles. So if you wanted to do, to really um, craft your own schema, you could use the version four. It's, uh, there is still some work to do uh, to make the developer experience optimal, but it is usable, and if you wanted to know more, I would suggest that you go to the Slack, Drupal Slack, and ask in the GraphQL channel if you have any issues with it. This is what it would look like if you install and enable that module in your uh, Drupal site, you get this graphical awesome in-browser uh, development tool. Same as we saw before, this is without doing any custom stuff. So on the right, we can see all of the fields that we can query and the arguments that they can take. And on the left, if we can start type, typing, we get auto-completion, and in this case, we are querying nodes and seeing them. 
seeing the labels that they have, which is only one in this case. But yeah, you can see that you can immediately um, play with it without having to know how it is implemented on the server. There's also the option of using it even if you don't want to, or if you don't have a decoupled project. This GraphQL tweak module, what it does is it provides you uh, with uh, a way of defining the queries in your tweak templates. So you can keep using tweak engine template as you would in a regular site. And then from there, you can use that data to display it as it makes sense for your view. If you are interested, uh, there's this blog at the Amazing Labs uh, blog, and it, uh, it links a couple of webinars that Philip Melap gave on the topic, and also links to a session that he gave in uh, DrupalCon Europe last year. And yeah, it's very detailed, and it also links to uh, project, an example project that is uh, accessible on GitHub. This is the Slack uh, Drupal, the Drupal Slack, and yeah, if you have any questions or any problems, both Philip Mellop and Sebastian Simpson are very active in there, asking questions and getting feedback from the people that are using the modules. There's a lot to cover. We uh, only saw like the most basic stuff. We didn't get into fragments or variables or there's uh, yeah many more concepts related to GraphQL. If you wanna you know, learn some more, I would recommend that uh, you go to howtographql.com. It's a tutorial and you can get um, your hands dirty immediately because it has these uh, widgets where you can start um, querying right away, and it really is a very good resource to get um, started with this. There's also principled GraphQL. This is by Apollo. Apollo, uh, Apollo provides a lot of very uh, good tools to work with uh, React and Apollo, and um, um, I mean GraphQL. And what they did in this uh, page is just uh, define a 10 set of um, good uh, well, of best practices that they found. Then the third link there would be the Explorer that we've been using for the example. This is the GitHub uh, API. And you can also go there, yeah, and start um, writing queries and exploring their schema and see what's available and how that could work. Then the last one is a book. It's really accessible, and it goes through the client side and the server side of things. It's quite long. It also gives you access to a Slack channel where you can talk uh, to other people that are learning GraphQL and with the author himself as well. That was it. Uh, any feedback is much appreciated. And then there's also the link to the to give some feedback on DrupalCon Seattle in general. Thank you. There's a few minutes left for questions. If anyone had one, uh, yeah. If you wanna come up here, or if not, I could repeat the question. Question is, how about using Drupal to discover what? Sorry, I. I I'm not sure I'm getting the question. If you could come up here, maybe I would hear it. Thank you. So the examples you went through were uh, geared towards uh, Drupal being the client and uh, exploring uh, data uh, using GraphQL. What about the opposite use case? Can Drupal serve content? Yeah. Uh, maybe let me go back to this slide here. Uh -huh. So in this case, using the GraphQL module, uh, you would have your content entities, your bundles, and your okay. content types as well. And then you would have access to all of that data. Great, thank you. It would expose it for you. Thank yeah. you.